Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we discussed the structure and the functions of the DCNL pathway. This pathway is really kind of the most complicated of the three ascending pathways that we're going to talk about. Spinal thalamic is a little bit easier to understand, I think, and a little bit easier to dissect in structure. Okay? But before we go any further, I just want to do a brief review of some of the concepts that we talked about um, that are still important here. So the spinal thalamic pathway, again, is one of our three major ascending pathways. An ascending pathway is a pathway of neurons that relays information from the periphery and brings it up to the cortex of the brain. Okay, so it's ascending from the periphery up to the brain. And these are relaying sensory information, and we'll talk about exactly what kind of sensory information is relayed through the spinothalamic pathway at the end of this video. Okay? So before we actually go into the details of the spinothalamic pathway, let's actually review a few important concepts. Uh, one is this concept of an ascending pathway. So the spinothalamic pathway is one of three major ascending pathways. And that just means that it's taking sensory information from the periphery, and when it brings it into the nervous system, it ascends up to the highest brain center, which is pretty much the cortex of the brain. So it's going up vertically. The descending pathways would be motor pathways, and they would be bringing information from the cortex down the nervous system and out to the periphery. Okay, Those are motor pathways. So spinothalamic is a sensory pathway, and we're going to talk about what sensations exactly are relayed at the end of the video. Number two is this concept of a three-neuron system. So DCML pathway was a three-neuron system, so is this one. We have a first-order neuron, which is actually this one right here. We have a second order neuron and then a third order neuron. And the way this works is the first order neuron synapses with the second order neuron, then that synapses with a third order neuron to bring information ultimately up to the cortex. So three neuron system. And then just remember this blue box right here, this blue rectangle represents the entire nervous system. And this dotted line vertically, this is just the midline. Okay. And this midline is going to help us determine in the picture uh, where these um, neurons have crossed over to the other side because they are going to decussate just as we saw in the DCML pathway, but they're going to do it at a, at a different spot. Okay. Also the levels here. Okay. This horizontal line right here represents the entry level of the spinal cord. This is where the first order neuron enters the spinal cord. This entire length up to the medulla right here represents the length of the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal cord is continuous with the medulla, and the medulla oblongata is on this level. Then we have the pons here, thalamus at the next level, and then the cerebral cortex at the highest level, the highest brain center. Then the only other thing to really review, again, is just a few definitions that we really have to understand. Um, when we talk about um, clusters of cell bodies, the clusters of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system, like this one, is a ganglion, or plural ganglia. But if we have clusters of cell bodies in the central nervous system, like this one right here, then it's a nucleus. Okay, So nuclei are clusters of cell bodies in the central nervous system. Ganglia are outside. Then if we talk about the axons, because remember neurons have cell bodies and they have axons, axons outside of the central nervous system are termed nerves. And then axons within the central nervous system like this are called tracts. So first order neuron right here. The first order neuron is bringing sensory information from a receptor out in the periphery into the spinal cord. This first order neuron, much like we saw in the DCML pathway, is what's called a pseudo-unipolar neuron. That means that this cell body of the pseudo-unipolar neuron has a distal axonal extension and a proximal axonal extension, proximal relative to the spinal cord. So when we talk about this first order neuron, the distal axon right here brings information from a sensory receptor to the cell bodies, and these cell bodies are found within the dorsal root ganglion, just like we saw over here in the DCML pathway. Then the proximal axonal extension projects from the cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion into the spinal cord. Now, when we looked at the DCML pathway, you notice that the proximal uh, axon is very long. It actually goes into the spinal cord and then ascends up 
the spinal cord in these dorsal columns up to the medulla. This is not what we see in the spinal thalamic pathway. Notice that this proximal axon of the first order neuron terminates right at the entry point of the spinal cord. And that's because right here, we have the cell bodies of those second order neurons. Okay, here's the cell bodies of the second order neurons, and these are in the lateral dorsal horns. Okay, the DCML pathways, these dorsal columns, are really more in this area in the back of the spinal cord right here. The spinal thalamic second order neuron nuclei, these are actually going to be on the lateral side of the spinal cord, but still considered a dorsal horn. Okay, now second order neurons. Again, we have the cell body at the entry level of the spinal cord, okay? So first order neuron comes in, synapses at the entry level. There's something else that happens at the entry level, the decussation or decussation. So the second order neuron in this case is going to decussate at the same level of the spinal cord from which the first order neuron entered, okay? It's at the same level. In other words, if we want to put that more concretely, if we had, for example, here, a first order neuron that entered the spinal cord at the level of T5, let's say T5, the decussation would occur at the level of T5. And then once these second order neurons decussate, they ascend together on the contralateral side of the spinal cord. Okay, So again, it's contralateral because notice that the ascension up the spinal cord is on the opposite side as the side that the first order neuron entered. Okay? And when we talk about ascension, we're talking about up the spinal cord specifically. All right? So it's ascending on the contralateral side. And as these second order neurons, as this tract is ascending up the spinal cord, it gets a name, the spinal thalamic lemniscus. Right? Just like we had the medial lemniscus over here in the DCML pathway, here we have the spinal thalamic lemniscus. And this lemniscus is pretty long. Okay? Notice it's going all the way up the spinal cord. It crosses into the medulla. Again, it goes up through the medulla, up through the pons, and then this spinal thalamic lemniscus is going to terminate at the thalamus. Okay? So the axons of this tract, also called spinal thalamic lemniscus, they are going to synapse with the third order neuron in the thalamus. And the cell bodies of this third order neuron are specifically called the VPL nucleus of the thalamus. VPL nucleus is ventral posterior lateral nucleus. And so it synapses with the third order neuron right here in the thalamus. And then this third order neuron carries information from the thalamus up to the cortex, the highest brain center, specifically the primary and secondary somatosensory cortex. Okay. And that's how you get information from the periphery out here into the spinal cord and then up to the cortex. So that brings up one final point, and that's what information is relayed uh, by the spinal thalamic pathway. So let's look at that. We keep mentioning information. What is that information? Well, just like the DCML pathway that had three types of sensation, the spinal thalamic, like the trigeminal, is also going to have three. And those are going to be discriminative pain, temperature sensation, and then coarse and crude touch. So coarse and crude touch, we'll just kind of go past that a little bit. It's pretty straightforward. Now for temperature, it depends on whether it's cool or hot as to what type of nerve fiber is going to be transmitting that information. So for cold or cool, it's going to be A delta fibers. For heat, it's going to be C afferents. Okay? Um, the only reason I mention this is because A delta fibers are somewhat myelinated, and they're a little bit bigger than these C fibers, which are unmyelinated completely. And so it's just kind of interesting that there's a difference in the workload there, difference in the sensation, whether it's cold or hot. But temperature is sensed by the spinal thalamic pathway. And then finally, we have discriminative pain. This is relayed by 1A and 1B fibers again. But really, discriminative pain, again, is pain that you're able to localize. There are other kinds of pain that are very difficult to localize. Um, those are actually going to be uh, sensed by what's called the medial pain system. Spinal thalamic is called the lateral pain system, and this is going to be discriminative pain. In other words, if you have a sharp pain in your arm from a cut, um, you're able to clearly, I mean, even if you couldn't see the cut, you're able to know exactly where that pain is coming from versus on your leg, okay? So you can discriminate between the locations. And again, these sensations right here, just like we saw for DCML pathway, are somatotopically mapped. So you can localize them within your brain so you know where they're occurring. 
that means we have high fidelity. And also, we're obviously aware of these sensations. You're obviously aware if you're in a cold environment versus a hot environment, or if something cold or hot touches you. You're aware if there's coarse or crude touch on your skin. You're aware of where pain occurs, assuming it's this type of pain. Okay? So these are consciously perceived and somatotopically mapped, so we can localize these sensations. Okay? So, hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the spinothalamic pathway. In the next video, we're going to be looking at the trigeminal pathway, and we're going to see it's a little bit more complicated than spinothalamic, but still much easier than DCML. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the following video, we're going to look at the withdrawal reflex. Thank you.